This is a learning place. You might say, well, yeah, but you know, I want messages that make me feel sing and I feel so good inside because you know you, you've just you've just given me a spiritual massage. How about I've just hurt your brain? I prefer you to leave here and say my brain hurts. Okay? <laughs>at right now we're going to be looking at the first part of verse 15 and only the first part of verse 15 of the first chapter of the book of Colossians uh, that reads who is the image of the invisible God and I will just tell you straight out the reason why I had to cut this verse in two is I realized in reading it there immediately without even digging too much into the ecclesiastical history and development of the study of the Bible, I recognized immediately this had to be um, the beginning, if you will, of what Paul essentially is getting into. The, the salutation, the greeting, and the prayer is behind us now. This verse starts essentially a defense, if you will, of the faith. He gets right into it. But it's not really a defense of the faith, and I want to explain a little bit. From verse 15 until approximately verse 20, we have, uh, we'll call it a refocusing and a laying plain of who Christ is. Now, believe it or not, uh, you know, we, we can say, well, in, in, in antiquity, um, they didn't have all the tools and the resources that we had, and they had the first eyewitnesses to Jesus that preached and then imagine the next generation and the next generation if they weren't rooted and grounded in the faith that had been essentially passed down to them. You can see very clearly how error and heresy crept into the church early on. We're talking in the first 20 or 30 years of the church being or churches being established in Asia Minor. So if you think about it, if, if errors in understanding develop that quickly, there has to be something pretty uh, significant in the fact that even today, there is a gross, still, gross misunderstanding. Now, when you think of, this is a difficult subject, when you think of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I've said this before, it is difficult to explain the concept, the understanding of the Trinity, in that these are one, they are the same, but they are also different and distinct. And so when I go into this verse, the reason why I immediately, my mind immediately leapt to, this has to be a very pivotable, pivotal uh, verse, is for the sake of a word that appears in the verse, this Greek word, we get our English word for icon from this Greek word, ikon, same word. So if you think about it, the text, who is the image, the icon of the invisible God. That got me to thinking about something. We must be clear first and foremost about the definition of this word, icon. Now, before I read and I brought out a, a, a book one of my books to read, which I don't do that often anymore, um, my mind kind of leapt to different things. You know, sometimes we have word associations. So the minute I read and translated icon, I started to think about icons in the church. Um, you know, those images, painted boards and whatnot. It's funny because I started to reflect on my past, my understanding in times past of what an icon might be understood or viewed at. And I held for the longest time, not of course not now, but for the longest time, that icons were, were evil and they were bad. Not, not so much that they were bad in and of themselves, but that because of the problem of people constantly venerating, taking something and then worshiping it, the icon itself is artwork. It's a spiritual, usually religious depiction, sometimes of Christ, sometimes of Mary, um, of the disciples. We probably have one of the largest collections of icons in private hands. And I can tell you 
that as I started on this subject, although what I'm saying has nothing to do with the rest of my message, I'm just putting this in as gratis, something clicked in my brain. Well, an icon, if not venerated, simply used as a door or a gateway for focus, to look beyond, to focus the mind, to look beyond that image to what will bring you into real contact, not because of the thing itself, but because of the focus of the mind to Christ or to the religious uh, depiction that you're looking at. It cannot be something viewed as evil. Furthermore, just think about it. In the Old Testament, when God gave the instructions to build the tabernacle, what did he say about the curtains? The curtains were, be to, were to be embroidered with the depiction of the cherubims. That in itself is, is the concept of an icon. Somebody approaching that would see the cherubims and that would be a stark reminder of what they are approaching, where they are approaching, what in whose presence they will be. Um, there are many other examples of this. So I, I wanna just make that as a little footnote. I was actually gonna take off on um, iconography of the church, but then I actually went in a different direction. The Lord took me there. So let me first read you, this is from Ralph Earl, Word Meanings in the New Testament, one volume edition um, from Baker Books. And what this is, is by each book, um, this is a very similar work to Vincent's and others who have done this, it basically shows you book by book highlighting um, the different words and giving some word meanings. It is indeed like a highlight of special words that then are somewhat defined in here. So under the Colossians heading for the word, for the Greek word ikon, which is being translated in our King James image, I'm going to read what he says. And it's, it's kind of lengthy, so bear with me a little bit. The Greek word for image is Icon, ikon, from which comes the English icon. It means a likeness, not, however, an accidental similarity, but a derived likeness such as that of the head on a coin or parental likeness in a child. Thayer, who's another scholar, Thayer says the term is applied here to Christ on account of his divine nature and absolute moral excellence. In the Synoptic Gospels, this word is used for the image of the emperor on a silver coin, the de denarius, Josephus uses it repeatedly in the same way. It thus signifies an exact representation. Uh, Philo employs the, this term to describe the logos, the word. Uh, Paul himself speaks of Christ as the image of God. That's out of uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Lightfoot writes, and these are all scholars, uh, solid, solid scholars, Lightfoot writes, quote, beyond the very obvious notion of likeness, the word icon involves two other ideas. And I'm going to write them out. Representation, that's one. And the other one is manifestation. This is important because these actually help us to understand a little bit. See, this is the problem with translation. When you say, who is the image of the invisible God, it doesn't quite capture the essence of the Greek word. And you have to admit that some people who are not clear on this will say, oh, it's just semantics, but it's not. This is the disease of theologians, though. You can get so caught up in in the smallest detail, but it's in sometimes the smallest detail that we will glean the clarity we need for better understanding. So let me recap a little bit. Lightfoot says two notions, representation, icon or icon implies an archetype of which it is a copy, and two, manifestation, the word, whether pre-incarnate or incarnate, is the revelation of the unseen father. Another scholar, Ellicott, comments, Christian antiquity has ever regarded the expression image of God as denoting the eternal son's perfect equality with the father in respect of his substance, nature, and eternity. See, I'm going to ask you a question, and you'll know why I'm going to go all out on this one. Have you ever really stopped to think when in the beginning 
in Genesis. For example, Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and it says, your King James reads, let us make man, but the Hebrew reads, let us make Adam. And there are other names for, uh, for mankind, but specifically, we were talking about Adam, the man Adam, not humankind or men as a type. That would be Ishi, the Hebrew word Ishi. Let us make Adam in our image. And there, if you were reading the Septuagint, our image is the same Greek word, ikon. And what's significant about that is I can wrap my mind around the fact that when God made Adam, he made him in his likeness. I can wrap my mind around that, and I can understand that. But what is mind-boggling is it doesn't say that of Cain and Abel. But then when Seth is born, it says that Seth was made after the image of Adam. And there's something remarkable there, as if to say there is a distinction now in the children, because the fall has already occurred. Those subtle hints tell you that Adam, therefore, was no longer in the state created likeness in his fallen state, and that Seth was made in the image of Adam. It doesn't say Seth was made in the image of God. He was made in the image of Adam, which is why you hear me constantly say, after the fall, all of humankind was plunged, the blueprint of humanity was plunged into the fallen image, no longer in the image of, and whatever that was, let me just say, for me personally, I believe that Adam and Eve, I've said this before, the image of God had to be an image of Shekinah, of light, of brightness, of splendor, also of perfection. And we know that that is not the pattern in which Adam and his children will be after the fall. So it's rather relevant that this word is used consistently through Scripture, but then this is where the problem emerges. And I'll say it like this. Same word icon is used in Genesis. Let us make Adam in our icon, in our image. So the question is, there actually is multiple questions here, but probably the first one, we know that the let us from the Hebrew is referring to the majestic plural. That means the Godhead. You know, people can't wrap their mind around what that might entail, but clearly you have the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit acting in creation. So the question that is begging to be answered is when it says that they were, they were made in his image, follow my train of thought. We have something that will be, we'll call it a conflict, but not really. See, when you get to the New Testament, Jesus, out of his own mouth, he says to the woman in John 4, God is a spirit and is to be worshipped in spirit. But don't go thinking all of a sudden that God doesn't have shape and form because part of this understanding of the word icon means shape and form. So when people take something and they don't attach all the other scriptures, you might think, well, because it says here, he is the image or the icon of the invisible God that somehow God the Father has no shape. That would be an error. Why? Because in Exodus 33, and I believe it's verse, starts at verse 18. See if I'm right, if the brain is working properly. And most of the time it's not, so it's okay. 33 and 18 is where Moses says, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And then he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon the rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by, I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand, that tells you their shape and form there, while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but not my face. That tells you right there, God cannot be invisible. 
Do you get what I'm saying? Yes. But there's a, there's a hint there that's picked up elsewhere. When he says, no man can see God. Here, in this time, no man could see God because the price of seeing God would mean death. Why? He's holy and we are not. But you get into the New Testament and you read out of John 1.18 where Christ says, no man hath seen God. Well, actually, John is writing, no man has seen God, but Christ hath declared him. And the Greek there, we've done this before, is exegesis, like scriptural exegesis, opening up, unfolding, or as the late Dr. Scott used to say, leading from behind a curtain to make a manifestation visible to all. Jesus was the manifestation in the flesh of God the Father. Part of this confusion, as I say, is that if people are not clear on going back to let us make Adam in our image and think somehow by taking bits and pieces of scripture that God is some amorphous mass, but, but not really, kind of invisible and um, kind of like that uh, apparition, but with no shape or form, we're sorely mistaken here. Why? Because Christ is the declaration. He is, he basically put God on display for humanity to see. Let me keep reading a little bit more here and we might get to some other points that can help us wrap our minds around the text. Edie, another scholar, has a beautiful approach to the study of this passage. He writes, the clause dazzles by its brightness and awes by its mystery, the invisible God, how dark and how dreadful the impenetrable veil. Christ, his image, how perfect in its resemblance and overpowering in its brilliance. We must worship whilst we construe and our exegesis must be penetrated by profound devotion. He further comments, visibility is implied in the very notion of an image. So we have to kind of scrap our thinking or our way of approach into the text to immediately jump to a conclusion based on an English interpretation. That is very clear right here. The spirit of the statement is that our only vision or knowledge of the Father is in his Son. He goes on to say, in his incarnate state, he brought God so near to us as to place him under the cognizance of our very senses. Men saw and heard and handled him, speaking, acting, weeping, and suffering. But he adds still to, at the right hand of the, of the majesty on high, he is the visible administrator an object of worship. And from the theological dictionary of the New Testament, all the contributors are in this one place, so I chose one book. Uh, he says, this is uh, Kittel from the theological dictionary of the New Testament. He says, thus, icon, icon, does not imply a weakened or feeble copy of something. It implies the illumination of its inner core and essence. Kittel himself says that in Colossians 1.15, all the emphasis is on the equality of the icon with the original. Phillips, who was another Bible uh, commentator, writes, um, he says here, now Christ is the visible expression of the invisible God. Jesus himself said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. So Paul is simply affirming the same truth about his Lord. Why should we make such a big deal about this? Because, as I said, it is incredibly important to understand how we should understand the meaning in the New Testament text. So if you are turned away from Colossians and you want to turn back, because that's what I just did, there are two things that I noted for myself. Uh, icon will refer to something that has shape and form and is repeatedly used to refer to the Father and Son. Both must have shape and form. We know this. So why is this concept so important? Um, in this article I just read, you remember, it gives the example of Jesus where he says, bring me the denarius, and he asks, whose image is on the coin? right? Whose image of it is on this coin? They say Caesar, and that's when he says, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. It is modernized. This is like looking at a, a quarter, and you see the, the image of George Washington. Now, we 
I think, for the most part, none of us here have personally met George Washington, uh, <laughs> although we did have a parishioner here by that name one time, uh, which is true, but he was not the George Washington, of course. Um, but we would be able to look and say that is his likeness from all the pictures and depictions we've seen. We wouldn't say it's similar to George Washington. Do you understand what I'm saying? We wouldn't say it, it looks like him. See, this is where words become important. We could say, yeah, I think it looks like him. Well, first of all, that would not be a factual statement on my part. Why? Because I never saw him in the flesh. I've only seen depictions that would help me to know what he looks like. Do you see how confusing this could be? To properly define this word and make it clear, and this is where when we have this type of ambiguity, it opens up for heresy, and that's exactly what happened. So I want to talk about, I want to give you a little bit of church history, and I don't mean to, uh, to bore you, but I really believe it is super important not only to do scriptural exegesis and to do grammar and pulling apart, but equally when we're touching this type of a subject, it's extremely helpful for, for us to go back in history and uh, revisit something that shook the church world and we in this day and age, it's, it's almost like we're impervious. We don't even think about these things. The matters back then were so grave in their dispute that it brought about ultimately um, several church council meetings. Now, when I say that, for people who are not familiar with ecclesiastical history, that's how many of the church's issues were resolved. How many books should be canonized was solved by a church council. The firming up of certain holy days, which were nothing but graphing or engrafting onto pagan, for the most part, pagan holidays, were established at church councils. There's a lot of things that were a body of holy people that came together that were uh, devoted to understanding clarity in the scriptures would gather and convene these uh, church councils. So back in the fourth century, there was a big, big issue in the church, and it was a controversy about the person and nature of Christ. A man by the name of Arius, born in Egypt, uh, he was a pastor, and he eventually uh, taught that God the Father was greater than his son, as the father would be superior to his son, and that the son, Jesus, had, and you have to listen to this, that Jesus had a beginning, that he wasn't eternal. This began the controversy all over the understanding of words. Now, this whole controversy was over one Greek letter. You ever hear the expression, I don't give an iota? <laughs> you ever hear that? Okay, well, iota is a, is a Greek letter which is ba basically equal to our letter I. And it is called, in the Greek, iota. So it's interesting that the controversy swirled around two uh, understandings. And there is your iota. See here, there is no I, and there's an I. These two words will become the fodder for several hundred men gathered, convening at a council to discuss whether or not Jesus is the same, uh, the same as the Father, or similar. Can you believe that one letter makes that distinction? One letter between same exactness and similar. And if Jesus is similar but not the same, that is like, you ever pull, you ever pull the thread on the hem of your pants? You know what happens after all the thread comes out? Down comes the hem. That's like pulling apart all of the Bible and dismantling clear understanding. So, what happened here, and I'll give you a little background, and I think this is important. I think history overall, in general, is important. 
certainly for what we're doing here, ecclesiastical history proves to be quite important. And so I'll tell you, as uh, the Emperor Constantine, as you know the story, who uh, supposedly, if you go with the legendary version, um, was going to war, crossing the Milvian Bridge, saw a sign in the sky, conquer in this sign, and uh, supposedly, according to that legend, uh, was converted to Christianity, and hence declared the Roman Empire a basically a haven for Christianity. It could now flourish because it was banned, uh, and there were several waves of persecution before his conversion. So now the, the whole empire is basically encouraged to embrace this new faith. And we're talking about in the 300s uh, AD. Now, with the coming of Christianity and the acceptance of Christianity, we begin to see um, different pockets, especially the church that forms what would become the Church of the East and the Church of the West in terms of theological understanding. Now, Constantine at this time feels very proud because he feels he's united the empire. But in fact, when it's brought to his attention, he has not. Why? Because there is such a big religious rift in Christian understanding that two groups have formed that basically are going to, and there are two initial groups that will spin off into fractions of other groups with other kinds of concepts and understanding. So, uh, Constantine sends his ecclesiastical uh, aid, whose name is Osius, to convene a meeting. This is the precursor to the Council of Nicaea that was held in 325 AD. He sends Osius and basically sends a letter both to Arius, who is the one basically propagating the heresy, and to the main protagonist on the right side of the fight named Alexander. So basically, to show you Constantine's understanding, he sends letters that basically say, hey, you guys are basically on the same page. You're basically, you have mostly the same ideas. Why don't you come together and just kind of embrace each other's ideas? It's a homogenization attempt. And neither Arius nor Alexander would have any part. It did nothing to quell or bring peace. In fact, it actually stoked the fire uh, for Arius to just push this controversy over the top. The controversy uh, surrounds Arius's understanding, as I just explained. And in fact, I have some bullet points here, if I can hear. The bullet points of Arius's views that will become known as Arianism. And these are terms that if you read uh, ecclesiastical history, you're going to encounter them. So I'm not saying something that's new. But it's important to at least have some spattering of church history because it tells you even back in the 300s and 325, people were fighting over meanings of words and very important meanings of words. So Arius comes up with, these are in simple terms, that there was a time when the Son of God was not. Before Jesus was begotten, he did not exist. The Son as creature and not creator, and that the Son was subordinate to the Father and not really God. So what we know is that when the Council of Nicaea was called, and this is a super important council, called in 325 at the behest of Constantine. Um, what happens at this council is kind of remarkable. So you've got churches, as I said, from the east and from the west. And the, these pieces of information will become important later as the church from the east and the west will they'll split and will eventually have the church that's known as the Orthodox Church and the church that's known as the Catholic Church. And there'll be that split that essentially divides theologically important points of understanding. But right now, this council is called, and um, probably in the order of a, somewhere between 225 to 250 men in attendance, religious people, to discuss the matter. And as is, was recorded by Rufinus, that um, council, some of the events, some of the highlights, uh, apparently Arius was summoned almost every day in front of the council of several hundred men 
to give answer of his doctrines. And what is kind of interesting is that out of this debate, these two words become the pitting point. So I moved you from just image icon to the real meat and potatoes because it, it, one of the arguments for same or similar came from a lack of understanding about image, icon, likeness, and the words I'm using. So it's interesting that this text and about two or three others are intertwined in this combat to expose, eventually, the heretical teachings that were being uh, promulgated here at Colossae. And why do I tell you? See, verse 15 is like busting open a door to attack the first problem at hand, false teaching. And instead of saying, hey, look, there's been error that's been propagated, he just, it's like he busts down the door and says, based on what I've told you uh, from verses 13 and 14, who is the image, the icon of the invisible God? He begins by breaking down the errors that would have been propagated right there on a lack of clarity and understanding about the person of Christ, his relationship to the Father. And we'll see as we get into the letter that both Gnostic heresies and a lot of very strange doctrines that were being circulated at the time, including angelology, that's the worship of angels, worship and study of angels. So um, right away in just these few words of the first half of verse 15, we can begin to understand that there was definitely something there that needed clarification. So ultimately what happens at this council is a creed is drawn up which becomes known as the Nicene Creed. And I'll read to you what the creed says. They did this thinking that if they produced a creed, it would clarify once and for all and dispel heresies as they were popping up. And it was just everywhere. You know, imagine today we have a better sense of who's doing what. But in that day, you know, when you talk about communication that takes three or four days to reach the next town, you wouldn't know what's being propagated and what's being preached. You wouldn't know unless you went to that town and you heard it, which is why somebody took the time to go to Paul and say, you've got to correct the errors that are going on. These people are going the wrong way. They're being misled and mistaught. So here's the creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father, that is of the substance, usia, of the Father, God of God, a light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, of the same substance, homoousis, that is what the Greek would read of this, with the Father, through whom all things were both made in heaven and on earth. Now, in case the creed didn't do its job fully, they issued several uh, attachments to the creed, which basically made it plain that if anybody preached these doctrines, they were to pronounce them an anathema. They were to curse them. They were to be considered as heretical teachings. Um, so it's not put to bed right away. If you want to know the council did what it did, produce the creed, OK. Now something interesting happens, and this is why lack of understanding and clarity can lead to just the worst tragedy ever. So while it was at the behest of Constantine that this Council of Nicaea is called, a bishop goes sideways, uh, Eusebius of Nicomedia goes sideways to Constantine. He says, Emperor, this is a mistake. This teaching, the teaching that has been put out as Homo usius, same. He convinces Constantine that it's a mistake, that it's not true. And so now Constantine embarks on this uh, Arianism trip, and he now believes what Arius has preached and taught. This type of mindset will stay within the empire until the death of Constantine. Then his sons make the matter worse. 
there is a great divide. So one son says, homo i usius, the other son says, homo usius, and you might say, well, what's the big deal? It's a big deal to say that Christ was not from the beginning, that the eternal word, when John says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, it's saying, no, that scripture is not true. It's saying that everywhere that we read of a majestic plural where there is the triune Godhead, it's saying, no, that's not true. It's also saying that Christ, if Christ was merely created, he's on the same plane as we are. No. So it's interesting now that the sons bring about this great rift, and it's only uh, by 381 after the Council of Chalcedon that this finally comes to rest, and they revert the entire empire back to homo o, not I, o, same. And that doctrine basically stays firmly planted until you get to modern times. In modern times, a new wave of heresy comes. Now, some people may not like what I'm going to say, but I have to say what I have to say because I'm a teacher and I'm putting information out there. Folks who are of the Mormon uh, propensity, if you will, want to call it that, they believe that Jesus was created. He is not eternal. He was not in eternity. He was not at the beginning in the creation. He was created. Now, a lot of times people, again, don't know theology and they don't have clarity. So it's very easy to join up to something not understanding what you're participating in. And this is why I tell you, this is a learning place. You might say, well, yeah, but you know, I want messages that make me feel, sing, and I feel so good inside because, you know, you, you've, just, you've just given me a spiritual massage. How about I've just hurt your brain? I prefer you to leave here and say, my brain hurts. Okay? Because at least, at least if your brain hurts, I know that I've been doing some <laughs> to the mind. You didn't come here and, you know, basically stone out and, okay. Uh, it, that's important to me. That's part of helping us to grow. And that's why I said you may leave here today with more questions. That's good. That's, that's really good because questions say, I got to get back in. I got to study. I got to look things up. How many of you have... You leave here with a question, you might spend a couple of hours, maybe some part of the week, digging and looking and maybe verifying or trying to get a question answered. You do that? Does anybody do that? Okay, so I'm not the only crazy person here. <laughs> so, what I want you to, to see in this, um, there are several ways we could pull apart these two words, by the way, which they ultimately ended up without the I, as I said, homo Uh, but generically speaking, we could, we could do homoousius and break down that word to say of one substance, like two different men, both are human beings with their own nature, yet they are individuals. Or if we said we have two uh, clay pots, we have two pots, but they are made of the same substance, they're both made of clay. So you can, it's very important to get the nuance of what I'm saying. Um, this word homoousius can also signify numerical identity. That is that the father and the son are identical in their being. Finally, we could say um, something that, is, that has the, the likeness, if you will, uh, not I, but likeness as in same. We could say, you, I'm sure you've heard this before, father and son, and somebody says, my God, he got the same eyes, right? So we're talking about, but these are two different people. So it's important to understand the minutia of this because it helps us when we go back into the text. You might say, well, how does this homoousius relate to where you started with icon? Well, it first and foremost clarifies something theologically speaking, that Christ is the same. That's why he said, remember they came and they said to Jesus, we want to see the Father. And he says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, when you start thinking about that, this is what's fascinating. You know, we, we have a lot of artwork that depicts Christ. But if you think about it, even in Scripture, we, we do have some depictions. We have some, some they're not 
uh, oh, he's five foot ten, he's got blue eyes, not like that. But we have certain things about him that we can know. We can know, for example, on the Mount of Transfiguration, a little bit about how he, I use the word, he was Shekinified, he was glorified on that mount. We can know, for example, by John's writing that he says when he was on the Isle of Patmos and the one that appeared to him was so bright and he goes on to describe the brightness of his, of his clothing and his appearance and he is describing none other than the risen Lord who is obviously returned to him whether in vision or in reality on the Isle of Patmos so it's important to, to understand when we talk about the person and work of Jesus Christ, it's also important to understand about the Father and their relationship. You know, as I said, I mentioned the opening of John. In the beginning was the Word. How anyone could take the concepts that are replete through the Bible and ignore them to say Jesus was merely created. Now this, I have to do this. This brings me all the way back to the necessity of the virgin birth. See, these are the things that nobody really wants to deal with because they're almost tied into each other in complexity, but when you unravel them, it becomes clearer and clearer. We're not dealing with created. In fact, if you look at the birth of the Christ child, before the child was born, the declaration that this would happen, which occurs, by the way, uh, right there in Genesis 3.15, we have that understanding. That's uh, several hundred, if not thousands of years before Christ came in the flesh. And we say, as John writes, when he says, we beheld his glory, he took on the tent of human flesh. Philippians says, he humbled himself and took upon him the form of a servant, which is essentially our likeness, so that we would see him we would be able to know him. You know, imagine if God appeared in the form, and we'll call it in the form and shape of the Father. Now, somebody might ask the question, well, then what does the Father look like if it says that Jesus is the image or the icon of the invisible God? Well, that gives you the clue that there, is, there must be the same substance. They are of the same substance. But that's where the Trinity goes poof, all right, and everything kind of falls apart. Because once you're there, that's that gray area where people have tried to pry it open, and I've just given you the best um, explanation or definition possible. But when we talk about this, as I said, going back to referencing the virgin birth, it's important to understand, even when we look and read the passages leading up to the birth of Christ, that was no ordinary child. You know, I, I, I've yet to, in all the people that I know who have had children, I have yet to hear anyone having heard a voice saying, you're going to bear a child without having intercourse. <laughs> Never mind, we'll get back to that later. <laughs> um, but I want to take you down this pathway for a minute because this kind of tells you how things cannot be when we, we're looking at the big picture, cannot be isolated. So you have the birth of, of the child, but as I said, no ordinary child. People knew that this was the child who was born king and deliverer. That's, as I mentioned last week, the wise men that came to pay homage to the Christ child. And then we see a, a jump from the child to the man in his public ministry. And as I read out of the article from er Earl's book, we see a man who healed, he fed, he preached, he could be touched, he sat, he ate. In fact, they called Jesus uh, a wine-bibber and a glutton, which is kind of an interesting thing, which means he partook, he ate, he drank, he did the things that humans do, and yet at the same time he was all man and all God and never separating the two except for one moment in time, one brief millisecond in time, and I don't know if it's separation of one or the other, but when the body, when he said it is finished in that last breath, and it says that he basically committed his spirit, uh, in that millisecond, the body, the, the earth closed, if you will, 
became that as all the sin of the world was laid upon him, the earth body in that brief moment became simply a body, no, we'll call it the God part, if you will, and that's hard to define again. That's one of those things that, eesh. But my point is, as we look at the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, we see in him, in fact, Paul says it right here when he says, uh, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He's the head of the body. He is the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. So over and over again, we see something rather different about this person, Christ. Now, if you, if you look at his life, and then you say, and he is the icon the visible icon of the invisible God that helps us in some way to understand, and it is a mystery, of the exact nature and relationship to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in this case, we're just talking about the two. It's equally a mystery to me. Some years ago, I was in a, a group setting. In fact, I think I, was in a, I think I was in a penitentiary somewhere speaking. Um, and the doctrine that was very popular being taught erroneously was the oneness doctrine, that there's only Jesus. You heard of that? The oneness doctrine, only Jesus. Well, again, if that's the doctrine that you're preaching, you basically have to take about, mm, I would say, 85% of this book and throw it away because this book talks about the triune God right at the beginning. Let us... Uh, last time I checked, us is plural, unless you're one of those people that s is singular and speaks in the plural. <laughs> I have known people like that. I think we should do this today, and they're by themselves. I don't know what that's about either, but <laughs> all right. So I, I think that this, um, the reason why I wanted to keep pushing on this is because in my mind, I really believe a lot of people, even believers who are strong in, in the faith, maybe don't have a greater clarity on the subject that when we talk about, for example, we pray and we pray and asking God whatever we ask, I'm not sure that we actually visualize and put some, we'll call it rubber meets the road, flesh on things to better understand. We're not talking about some, um, like I said, floating mass. We're talking about the one who is the visual representation of the invisible God. And if you think this is a soul doctrine, if you will, or a soul appearance, in the scriptures, you've got plenty of examples, and I'm going to read some of them to you. Actually, we're going to spin through some of those that use this uh, word image or icon, if you will, um, to get just a little bit more clarity. So, if you will turn with me to Matthew 22, I may have referenced these already, but you can make notes of where these are to be found in case you want to go back and read and study some more. So uh, from Matthew 22, beginning at verse 20, uh, he asked them whose image and superscription is on the coin. They said unto him, Caesar's. So that's the first example. Romans 1.25, I believe. Yep. Um, so in this whole section, actually beginning at, let's start at verse 21 and read the section down. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image, an icon, made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. So you can see the use there. Um, then again, there are so many different references here. Uh, in Corinthians, Paul says God, man is the, the image of the glory of God. Um, you've got references, by the way, all the way through Paul's writing. And then in Revelation, there is a heavy, heavy dose of these probably, let me see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, at least eight, possibly up to 10 references in the book of Revelation that all have to do 
with when the people will bow down and worship the false image of the beast and the false prophet, the beast rather. So there's, there's plenty of, uh, we'll call it evidence, to say that this is not just something that says it's like. And remember that we have a propensity. It's in our nature to want to make God more anthropomorphic. We want a God that we can carve with our hands, that we can touch, that we can see, that we can feel, which is why when you read in the Old Testament, for example, they carved the wooden Dagon, you know, the fish god. And it's, you know, kind of silly where they, they carve the god and they're worshiping the god and then the god falls on the ground and it's like, oh, the god's on the ground. Oh, okay, better pick the god up because the god can't pick itself up, right? So there's, there's a lot of that that we kind of need to understand. And then on top of everything else, if you wanted the last bit of uh, confusion here, is you got to remember the setting and the time of this writing. There was still an immense amount of pagan worship in Asia Minor. And we know, for example, when Paul, we read in the book of Acts, when he went through Athens, and the city is just replete with philosophers and all kinds of weird stuff. I mean, they have all these different things going on, but it's, it is steeped in pagan worship. So this would be even more striking to somebody who had converted from paganism to be reading. For, just forget the word image for a minute, and you're reading this word in the Greek, or you're hearing it preached to you, icon, which would conjure up to those minds ritual, votive offerings to gods made with hands. Now, what a radical difference between those gods made with hands and a god that you cannot touch and you cannot see. And in the case of the people at Colossae, they didn't have the fortune that the Apostle Paul had of seeing or meeting the risen Lord on the Damascus Road. They didn't, like us, we don't have that pleasure. So what we have to do is engage in walking by faith and not trying to see, which is, by the way, what keeps most people out of the church. They want evidence. The skeptics demand to see something that would uh, completely disperse all of their doubts, and it doesn't work that way. This is, this is a two-part faith. One is learning. Becoming a disciple means being a learner. You, and what does learning mean but opening up your mind to clear understanding on a subject from this book, I hope, unless you're reading, you know, your best life yet, which uh, is the gospel of Skabala. <laughs> if you don't know what Skabala is, look it up. It's a Greek word. It's uh, the politest way I can say excrement publicly. Okay, so uh, now that we've said all that, what I, what I want you to leave here with today is something kind of thought-provoking. So back to the test, text, who is the icon of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? And we'll tackle the rest of this, uh, God willing, next week. But I want you to think about this. If Christ is the icon of the invisible God, then we do have the capacity to know, at least in part, what God looks like. You know, when people say, oh, you can't know. You can't know that. Or, Go the other way. The caricatures that we were taught as children. God is, uh, God is old. He's got a white beard. He's got a white flowing robe sitting on a throne. The wind is blowing like he's in a Revlon commercial. <laughs> no. no. Now, I'm, 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 what I'm saying to you, though, is when you start to try and really put flesh and blood on this, you realize that we have a revelation here. And it's a revelation that although it might seem minute and quite irrelevant, it's actually quite important. Because I've imagined, I've asked the questions. I told you, nobody can ask more questions than me. I've asked the question, you know, why is it, for example, I mentioned out of Exodus 33 and verse 18, where Moses is pleading with God, let me see you. And God says, you can't see my face, but I'll let you see my, my, my back parts. I don't know, maybe God said, my back is better than my front. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> or, I love that story. Uh, you remember the story of Mondariere? 
my mon derriere has two parts? <laughs> Never mind. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say that. I just did, but I didn't say it originally, OK? Uh, you know, when you, when you don't know a language sometimes, it's helpful to just not try and speak it. But what we do have is the knowledge, even from the Old Testament, form. Remember, he said hand. He said back parts. No man can see my face, which tells you he's not. As text out of context, people would take John 4 to mean God is a spirit, which means he has no shape or form. No, what he was implying in that statement is in context what they were looking for, what that woman might have been looking for. And he says, essentially, an explanation to a pagan or a heathen of what faith is by, by making that statement. But in reality, we know that this verse clarifies for us he does have shape, he does have form. He has features that would be like the features that were passed on or shared or of the same essence and substance as his dear son, Jesus Christ. So just a little food for thought. I know this will probably, for some of you, be very frustrating because we're talking about a slight, just a slight little turn there in the word. But listen, if it could create a whole group of people who worship in this modern day and age, who believe that Jesus was created, and again, why, forgive me for saying this like this, but why would I pray or why would I want to worship God if he is not eternal, if he was not from the beginning, if he did not speak and bring everything into creation, it means that I'm talking to something less than who wouldn't be God. And so if you think about it, people who are in this particular, I don't want to maybe call it a denomination or a sect or a cult, uh, they have this belief, and it's rather unfortunate because what it does is it robs the individual of understanding that before the foundations of the earth were even made, he, he spoke your name. Now, tell me how you could even believe for a minute that he's created and that he wasn't always just as the Father and just as the Son. So when I do these things, like I did today, it is to clarify, to make clear that hopefully we leave here today. And as I said, you may not leave here having the feeling of a spiritual massage with all the tinglings, but you leave here with a little bit more information and hopefully a lot more questions to go and drive you mad for the week until you come back for more torture next week. <laughs> so with that being said, that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.